Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. Whether you're here in the room or participating through Facebook and YouTube, we're glad you could join us. Before we begin today's talk about the girls next door bringing the home front to the front lines, I'd like to let you know about two other programs coming up next week here in the McGowan Theater. On Thursday, February, oh, this week actually, um, on Thursday, February 14th, we're hosting two programs. At noon, we'll present the documentary film Chisholm 72, Unbound and Unbossed. The film chronicles the 1972 presidential campaign of Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman elected to Congress and the first to seek nomination for the presidency. In honor of the 50th anniversary of her election to the House, we also have a featured document display of her 1969 oath of office. That display is on upstairs in the East Rotunda Gallery. And at 7 p.m. on the 14th, we'll look at music in the life of President Lincoln in partnership with the Virginia Chamber Orchestra and the Lincoln Group of the District of Columbia. We'll explore President Lincoln's musical tastes Accompanied by video clips of the orchestra, a distinguished panel will discuss music in the Lincoln White House, the many performances Lincoln attended, and the role music played in his life during the Civil War. Check our website, archives.gov, or sign up at the table outside to get email updates. You'll also find information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities. Upon opening a new book, some people first scan the table of contents. Others may head for the index or plunge straight into chapter one, page one. I like to take a look first at acknowledgments. And so often, there's a wonderful payoff for that detour. On so many occasions, the names of National Archives staff appear on those pages. And I'm very proud of the work our staff do every day to help researchers navigate through the records. And this sort of public recognition signs a light on their dedication to the mission of this institution. In the acknowledgment section of The Girls Next Door, Cara um, Buick remarks that finding one's way through military and civilian records of several wars at the National Archives was a daunting task. The Tab Lewis, Will Mahoney, Martin Gedra, and Eric Van Slander helped her find her way so she could uncover information she needed. Even the retired archivist, Rick Bolin, um, gets a mention for continuing to help even after he retired from the National Archives. Whether you're a published author, a student, or a beginning geo genealogist, our staff are there for, for you to help you find your, way, your own way through the formidable volume of records in our care. And we're gratified each time a researcher publishes a work that couldn't have been told without access to those records because that book, that article, that blog post means the stories once locked in folders and files are now out in the world, touching unknown numbers of readers. Now let's hear from Dr. Vurek um, about her new book and the stories of the women who volunteered to work in war zones from the First World War to Iraq and Afghanistan. Kara is the Lance Corporal Benjamin W. Schmidt Professor of War, Conflict, and Society in 20th Century America at Texas Christian University, where she teaches courses on US wars and American society, gender and war, and memory and war. Her first book, Officer, Nurse, Woman, the Army Nurse Corps in the Vietnam War won the Lavinia L. Doc Book Award from the American Association of the History of Nursing was named a Book of the Year in the History and Public Policy by the American Journal of Nursing and was a finalist for the Army Historical Foundation Distinguished Writing Award. She also edited the Rutledge Handbook on Gender War and the U.S. Military and is co-editor of the University of Nebraska Press's book series, Studies in War, Society, and the Military. She is currently co-editing a, a collection, Managing Sex in the U.S. Military. She currently serves on the advisory board to the Eastern, Nas Eastern National for Vietnam Women's Memorial. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cara Dixon Buick. Hi, good afternoon and thanks for coming. 
I appreciate you coming. Um, this weather would have shut down the entire state of Texas where I now live, so I'm, I appreciate the fortitude of folks um, coming out today. Um, I want to thank Douglas Swanson for the invitation and David for that very kind introduction. Um, I'll also apologize in advance. That is my one-year-old up in the corner, and I make um, no guarantees about her behavior this afternoon, but we hope she'll be okay. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to start with a, a short passage from the book and then use that as a way of kind of introducing several questions and themes that I want to talk about today. Um, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, the men of Company B had had a rough few weeks. The Bravo Bulls, as they called themselves, were part of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, one of the first combat units assigned to Vietnam in early 1965. They were doing their best to defend an airstrip at Benoit, <clears throat> a few miles northeast of Saigon, but their new M16 rifles kept jamming, making that job more difficult than it was already. When the men weren't in firefights, they waged a war of attrition against the leeches and spiders that crept into their uniforms. Although the men's newly arrived young Lieutenant Jack Price could not do much to stop the insects, he did manage to get the cleaning rods they needed to keep their rifles firing by calling in a favor from a college buddy. Price's resourcefulness earned the men's appreciation and convinced them that he could deliver another item that they believed would make their war more endurable. On a whim, the men told Price that what they really needed was a personal visit from one of Playboy magazine's playmates. A few years earlier, the magazine had launched a promotion that anyone who bought a lifetime subscription would have the first issue personally delivered by a playmate. It seemed a long shot, but Price sent a formal request to Hugh Hefner from the, bottom of the, from the depths of the hearts of 180 officers and men. Price mused that loneliness in a man's heart is a terrible thing and would be particularly acute during the upcoming holidays. Although the beauty of Vietnamese women is unquestionable, he admitted, what the men needed was a real, living, breathing American girl. And after very careful consideration, they had unanimously decided that the girl they most wanted to see was Jo Collins, 1965 Playmate of the Year. And that was her cover. And I promise all of this is suitable for work. Um, but Price promised that if Jo Collins couldn't come, that any Playmate of the Month would be received with open arms. He enclosed the $150 subscription fee and closed by saying that if the men's request could not be met, Hefner should just please forget about us, return our money order, and we will fade back into the jungle. Collins didn't make it in time for Christmas or for New Year's, but she did fulfill the men's dreams when she made a personal visit early the next year. After delivering the first issue to Price, who by then was hospitalized with a devastating arm wound, she greeted the Bravo Bulls as they returned from patrol. One confident grunt locked her in a long kiss on behalf of his cheering and probably very jealous comrades. They renamed their unit Playboy Company in her honor. And this is a picture from Playboy Magazine's Twitter feed um, that they ran on Veterans Day a couple years ago um, to show how much they support the troops. Um, piece from their historical archives. So what exactly is a Playboy model doing in Vietnam? All right, that's a pretty good question, right? <laughs> um, here she is sort of with the men, um, you know, wearing her Playboy shirt. Um, this is her flying in. They've painted on the side of a U.S. government property helicopter, by the way, Playboy special. Um, she's visiting the men's billets and pointing out her own um, centerfold there. Um, now, it sounds more like something out of the scene from Apocalypse Now, right, where the, the Playboy bunnies come in on the helicopter, chaos ensues. It sounds more like something out of fiction um, than it does out of a history book. Uh, but in fact, Collins was only one and one of the most famous of thousands of American women who went to Vietnam to entertain American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Now, Collins, women like uh, Raquel Welch, these women were among the most famous. They capture most of the headlines. Um, but far more common are average girls from home. These are young women in their early 20s who had a, a desire to do something for the war effort. Um, many of these women perform musical and theatrical acts under the USO. Many of them are special services hostesses. Others, known as Donut Dollies, worked for the Red Cross 
and operated Red Cross recreation centers where men could find coffee and donuts, music, games, friendly f smiles from home. And the women continued what was by then a very long tradition of sending women to war zones to entertain soldiers. Thousands and thousands of women have done this um, since World War I. Like these women in World War I, they opened canteens where soldiers could find a friendly face, coffee and donuts. They performed on stage with the USO, sometimes even on beaches, as here in World War II in the Pacific. They played games, they made small talk, um, and when possible, they brought a bit of a brief reprieve to the battlefield. But why? Why did the military spend a lot of money and devote a considerable amount of time and resources to bring thousands of women to entertain soldiers to drink coffee and dance with them on far-flung battlefields. And what was that work like for the women who are asked to do it? Now, those are the kinds of questions I ask in the book, and we're not going to answer all of them today, of course, um, but I thought we might look at a couple of them. Um, so first, why are these women here? Right? Why is the military spending all this time and money to send young American women to war zones? And to understand that, we have to go back to World War I and, and it's sort of a, a shift in the ways that we think about the military. But before the Americans entered World War I, most Americans didn't think of the U.S. military in the way that we do today. All right, today, if your children join the military, you're very proud. This is kind of them growing up, becoming adults. It's very respectable and honorable work. All right, before World War I, enlisted men in particular were not thought of as very honorable. Right? Officers were one thing that was different, but enlisted men were generally sent um, to the western frontier. They were on the southern border, Native American wars, right? chasing Pancho Villa, doing that kind of work. And there were often reports that kind of surfaced of these guys getting into a wee bit of trouble. Right? Um, and most people didn't want that for their children. On the other hand, if you thought of these men at all, you probably thought, well, they're kind of hard scrabble men, they do dirty work, and they deserve a little bit of fun. So most people just didn't think about it. On the other hand, when the United States got close to joining the Allied effort in World War I and selective service came up, now all of a sudden your son might be drafted, and now all of a sudden you care a great deal about what happens in Army camps. right? You care a whole lot about what kinds of things are going to surround your son. Um, and so people started to really pay attention, and very optimistic, progressive organizations got involved. Um, the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that the Selective Service Act was very unpopular um, on the eve of World War I, right? The Americans had not had a draft since the Civil War. That didn't go so well in many ways, and Americans were very skeptical about a draft. Right, so you combine the fear among many people that you're going to you know, now draft my son and he's going to get in trouble, and then you're going to send him to France, right, which most Americans thought of as just this land of debauchery and insanity, you know, craziness, everybody got into trouble in Paris. Um, that made a lot of Americans very nervous. And so organizations like the YMCA and the Salvation Army worked with the military to send women abroad. Um, they sent about 3,500 women, most with the YMCA, about 100 with the Salvation Army. Um, and these women opened canteens and huts all across the Western Front. And the organizations explained these women's work as sort of sending reminders of home. Right? We're going to send American women. They're going to remind these young boys of why they're there, why they're fighting, um, what they have to return to. Um, it's a symbol of a supportive home front. Um, and most importantly, these women are going to keep the boys out of trouble, right? The boys are going to come to a YMCA hut, and they're going to get coffee and donuts and talk with girls from home. They're not going to, like, go to Paris, right? And this is sort of the PG version, but hopefully everybody's with me on this and knows what going to Paris might entail, right? And so this, to us today might sound very naive, right? Just send girls from home and it'll all be fine. Everybody will behave themselves. Might sound a bit optimistic, um, but in World War I, this was um, very much the thought, right? These women are going to sort of entice these men to come stay in the hut, not go to Paris. 
right? Men must be furnished with healthful amusement or they will turn to the first petticoat they see. It was a Red Cross official who explained this program, right? Healthful amusement or they'll turn to the first petticoat they see. I have to explain petticoats to undergrads sometimes. That gets fun. <laughs> now, some of this optimism is not borne out um, exactly by World War I. Lots of men get into trouble going to Paris in World War I. But a couple decades later, as the United States sort of looked to World War II, they again turned to organiza civilian organizations to send women to war zones. Um, and by World War II, these women um, are going through the Red Cross. Um, think of Red Cross Clubmobile program that you know women are driving sort of double-decker buses and converted military jeeps and trucks that are equipped with donut machines. They're driving these all over the, the Western Front. They're driving them all over the China-Burma-India theater. They're opening clubs um, where you can come and get donuts and coffee. Um, you can j dance the jitterbug with girls from home. And in 19... 41, the USO formed and started to send um, entertainers to war zones. And most of the women that we think of, like Marlene Dietrich, are the famous women um, who did USO tours, but far, far, far more common were ordinary women we've never heard of, right? These are women who had a singing talent, um, who could act, who had some sort of talent, signed up with the USO and went to the war zones um, in hopes that Eventually, you know, after the war, we, they would come home, and that would kind of boost their entertainment career. Uh, but the vast majority of USO women are not women we've heard of. They didn't make the headlines except in their local newspapers. Um, but thousands of these women go to war zones, and by World War II, again, there's not really a hope on the military's part that this is going to keep the boys out of trouble. They kind of have forgotten that goal in World War II, but what they are concerned about is long deployments, right? What will it mean to send men abroad in these deployments for the foreseeable future, right? Because we know how long the deployments were, but at the time, of course, they did not. Um, and so there was a lot of concern on the military's part that we need to send um, women from home to kind of help ease the stresses of long deployments, particularly in non-Western theaters. There was a lot more concern about getting women to the Pacific, getting women to the China-Burma-India theater, um, than there was, say, getting them to Britain. All right, so in non-Western theaters, that, that concern um, was very, very pronounced. Um, a general, an Army Air Force general in Burma in 1945 said that the presence of women in these faraway outposts made the difference for the servicemen between savagery and civilization. And so the women are, are being sent to do largely the same kinds of things, but it takes on a bit of a different um, purpose in World War II. Now, this model of the USO and the Red Cross continues in the Korean War. All right, again, famous women, Marilyn Monroe makes a lot of um, splash in the press. But it, most of the women are like these two Red Cross women um, serving coffee. You, we wouldn't know their names. All right, this is kind of the model. Um, that continues in the Vietnam War. Um, where you have um, Red Cross women. By then, they're, they're known as donut dollies um, and USO women. Um, and this woman traveled um, on a USO tour, and the purpose of her act was essentially fashion shows. Um, and so you can see sort of the USO <clears throat> model is everything under the sun, all right, from Marilyn Monroe to um, fashion shows. Right, and in the Korean and the Vietnam Wars, there's a lot of talk in the military on the importance of these women being American women and not Asian women, right? There's a lot of, um, you know, as the men said in their letter to Hugh Hefner, right, there are lots of women around that they can look at, um, but what they really want are living, breathing American girls, right? Now, at the end of the Vietnam War, um, when the draft ended, and the United States switched to an all-volunteer force. These kinds of programs um, that use essentially donut dollies, um, those kinds of programs go away, right? The USO still travels around. Um, it's a little different today, right? The military um, is made up of far more women. Um, it's a much more diverse force, and it includes a whole lot of families. And so today, Elmo goes on tour with the USO. Right, Elmo was not <laughs> in Korea, um, but Elmo tours around military bases today. Um, 
At the same time, the USO still sends um, famous women. The, U the USO only does um, famous tours today. And we've still got some um, rather scantily clad performers, um, including the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders who've traveled um, abroad annually since 1979. Um, so in some ways, these programs seem rather innocuous, right? These are kind of symbols of the all-American image that the na nation wants to project, kind of mom and apple pie. This is, uh, I guess, mom and watermelon in this case. Um, but this is kind of the image that Americans want, right? This is a reassuring image to families who are worried about sending their sons, their sweethearts, their husbands, their brothers to war, right? This is what you want to think happens in war, right? Johnny from home goes to the USO club and has watermelon with Susie from Kansas or whoever, right? This is, this is a very comforting image. Um, it's also a very comforting image of American women in war zones, right? In wars, wars that frequently introduce all sorts of changes to women's lives and lots of changes that are not welcomed by everybody, this is a very conventional image of American womanhood, right? They're always in um, dresses. They're looking very professional. They're doing kind of conventional work, even as wars you know, demand that women do all sorts of sort of unconventional work. Um, it's also a very sort of reassuring image of the American home front, right? This is the image of a supportive American home front, sort of the nation is behind you, um, and this image becomes far more important, I think, later in Korea and especially in the Vietnam War when the home front wasn't necessarily united in support of that war, right? Sending this, this kind of work abroad suggests to not just the servicemen that, that, yes, we are behind you, but it also is sort of a reassuring image to the home front itself um, that this is what we do. Um, and it's interesting, all of the organizations, um, the YMCA uses this, the USO, the Red Cross, all of these organizations use this phrase that they are sending um, or creating a home away from home for these men in war zones. Um, and that's something that they use consistently across the century. And these women do do that. They absolutely do. Um, but I think their work is a bit more complicated. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of what this work demands of the women, right? What is this work like for um, this woman who is probably in her mid-20s, she's very likely single, she's probably never traveled far from home, um, it's probably her first, chance, her first time abroad, right, and now she is doing this kind of work in a war zone, um, and that must have been um, a pretty interesting experience for her. Um, these women are asked to represent mama, sister, and sweetheart. And that all sounds good until you stop to think, how do you represent mama and sweetheart at the same time, right? And so it gets a little complicated. Um, these women are to help the men relax in a very stressful environment. They're to help them sort of decompress. They're to make the men feel comforted and supported and welcomed. They're to keep them from going to Paris. Um, and how are you supposed to do that? Right? The organizations always are very, very clear and very intentional in saying what these women are doing is respectable, right? that these are upright, respectable young women from home, there's nothing nefarious going on. Um, they're very, very clear about that. And every aspect of these women's lives is very carefully regulated. Right? So the uniforms they wear are carefully designed to suggest they are professionals. Um, their hairstyles are regulated, right? In World War II, there's this big blow up in the Red Cross because the women all wanted to wear bangs and they had the Veronica Lake hairstyle. And the Red Cross officials said, oh no, that's a little too, a little too much. Um, but the, you know, these men making these decisions, so we'll, wait, we'll let the women figure that out. Um, you know, they said, women, you need to have your nails manicured so your nails look nice, but don't wear red nail polish, right? That's a little too risque, right? I mean, they're, they're micromanaging lots of aspects of these women's lives to make sure that nobody can ever say these women have um, sort of unwholesome motives or they're there for the wrong reasons or anything like that. 
Um, the women are also taught in their training before they go abroad to wear perfume, wear ribbons in your hair, right? Do things to make you look sort of conventionally feminine, right? To look the part of all American womanhood. Um, but your work also asks that you do things you've been told all of your life never to do, right? As respectable young women from home, you never talk to strange men, right? You're never to talk to men who you ordinarily wouldn't socialize with, right? In World War I, you don't talk to, if you're from the upper class, you don't talk to immigrant men, right? But this work demands that you do that, right? It asks women to come out of their comfort zones, to initiate conversation with strangers, but not just to initiate conversation, but to make these men feel as though they are the center of the universe, right? Some of their duties involve fashion shows, like the picture from the Vietnam War, um, <clears throat> in several different wars, they run um, what we would think of as like the dating game from the 70s, right, where the, the Red Cross woman is selecting from three GIs, and then they go on a date that's paid for by these programs, right? So it's a very conflicting sort of set of goals, right? And how are the women to manage all of that at the same time, right? How are you supposed to walk this kind of fine line between respectable and maybe a little too friendly, right? You're supposed to be friendly, but not too friendly. You're supposed to be cute, but not too cute. How do you do that, All right? And so for women like this, this woman here, Emma Young Dixon, she was with the YMCA in World War I. Um, she was from a very privileged background. She grew up um, with everything she could ever imagine and desperately wanted to do her part in the war effort. And I love this picture of her because she gets sent to France and she opens a, a hut um, for the 7th Machine Gun Battalion. And on the opening day, she stands up and she makes a speech to all of these doughboys. And the YMCA would have been very proud of her because she says everything that the program was intended to do. She says, I'm here, I'm your surrogate sister. I will do everything your sisters and your mamas would do for you if they only had the chance. And then you turn the page in her diary that's housed at the YMCA archives, and you see pictures like this, right? And I think to myself, now Emma, you said you're to be their sister, but I suspect that either of these two men are not looking at you in the same way that they look at their sister, right? I don't have their diaries, but I'm pretty sure that's not how they look at their sister, right? And Emma knew that. And so her diary is filled with accounts of men coming into her hut and staying a bit too long or proposing marriage again, right? And so she, she writes about these two men in her diary, and she said that one night, um, she said that two, two men, Marine Lieutenant Palmer and Lieutenant Peck, took Helen and me for a walk, by the, and we sat by the river. Helen was a woman in her hut she worked with. They went for a walk by the river. She said, it is a most romantic spot, so we didn't linger long. Right? She's figuring out very quickly how to keep the men at arm's length. Right? How do you make them feel comforted and supported and as though you have a you know, personal connection with them without letting them get too close? Right? And so these are the kinds of things she has to learn how to manage every day. Um, there's another entry in her diary that's just heartbreaking. Um, there's a, a man who somehow got himself a motorcycle, and he shows up everywhere she goes, and he's always visiting her at the hut. And he tells her, he sends a message one day that he wants to come tell her something. And she writes that she knew what he wanted to say because she'd heard it from him before, and she'd heard it from thousands of other men. And she said that he was on his way to the front, and so she decided that she should just let him say it anyway. And so he comes by and he proposes marriage again, and she says, I'm entirely too busy to get married right now, right? She just deflects it. Um, but it's heartbreaking in that she knows, she says he's going to the front, right? She knows he might not come back. And it's her job to just let him kind of unload that emotional burden. And so that's another element of what these women are doing is that what they're doing is very emotional work, right? It's, it's helping the men with their emotions but it's very emotional work for the women. And that's never a concern on the part of the organizations, right? Women are to relieve men's boredom, um, but they're also to help them process war, right? They're to help them grieve, they're to help them decompress, 
Um, they are to help them transition at the war's end from soldier back to civilian. And how are you to do that, right? You've been taught in your training how to play cards and you've read up on all of the sports teams so that you can talk to these men about their favorite baseball team. But nobody's trained you in grief counseling, right? The military has grief counselors. But often what happens is that they enlist Red Cross women or USO women or special services women to come in and sit with the men, right? In World War II, the Red Cross... Um, used women to work with pilots. And I think this, this is an interesting case because pilots were sort of a new beast for the military in World War II, right? The new air war, they were really kind of figuring out what it meant to be a pilot and how stressful that was. And so the military operated what they called rest homes for pilots. And after a set number of missions or when a physician said that the pilot needed a break, they would send these men to these rest homes. And the Red Cross staffed the clubs, or these homes, with women. And it's interesting that in these clubs, um, the Red Cross always insisted that women be in uniform, right? The uniform was, in many ways, sort of the outward sign that you were a respectable person. Um, and that was your professional status. But in the rest homes, the Red Cross said, do not wear uniforms. We want you to wear dresses. We want you to wear ribbons. We want you to be as girly, essentially, as you can be. Um, because the, red, the rest homes were to help the men kind of transition out of this very stressful environment and back into civilian life. And they told the women to operate dances, essentially so that the men could kind of test themselves out and learn how to be around women again. And the Red Cross women who did this work talked about how horribly hard that was. Because a lot of these men would then go again on missions and not come back. Um, and several of the women who work with pilots talk about um, how at the beginning of their, of their time with the pilots, they knew everybody's name, they knew where they were from, they knew all about them. And they quickly realized that the way they were going to make it through that assignment was to stop learning names and to not get to know those men as men. And that was how they coped, right? And so it's, it's, kind of, it's heartbreaking to see these women kind of try to do this work while trying to manage their own emotions. Um, a couple decades later in Vietnam, commanders would call for the Red Cross donut dollies to come out when their units had been through heavy firefights. And so they're sending women in their early 20s, again with no experience in counseling, to essentially be counselors. Um, and this woman, Emily Strange, she wrote that, um, like the Beatles song, she said that every morning she put on her Eleanor Rigby face. And so no matter what happened in the morning, she put on her smile and her makeup, and she just went out and did her job. And then she had to figure out in the evenings how to come down from that, right, how to, how to manage that kind of work. And remember that these women are doing all of this work in the middle of a war zone, right? Um, I love this picture because the women are surrounded, literally surrounded, by the machinery of war, right? And they are doing this work in very dangerous places, um, and it's interesting to me that the women embrace the danger, right? Donut dollies helicoptered all over the place in Vietnam into landing zones and to fire support bases. They helicoptered all over the place. Um, in World War I, Emma Dixon um, lived in, the woman I just talked about, she lived in a home with a French family, and her diary just kind of mentions casually one day that the home down the street was hit by a bomb. Um, they are living and working in very dangerous environments, but they embrace that danger in many ways as a sign that they are in it as with the men, right? That they are in the war just as the men, um, and they are there with them. Um, they kind of see it as their camaraderie with these men. Um, Emma wrote, for example, when the 7th Machine Gun Battalion was sent to Chateau Thierry um, in the late stages of World War I, she writes that all of the reports coming back from the front are horrible. The men are under fire, it's very dangerous. And in the next line she says, I want to go too. Why are the women being held back? Why can't we go to support our men? Um, and so in all of these wars, these women embrace the danger as a sign of their commitment, right? Their camaraderie with the men, their commitment to the war. But what the women are afraid of in terms of danger is not the war. Um, you never see women talk about how scared they are of the war. When they talk about being scared, it's being scared of the men that they have to serve. And 
that is not to say that the vast majority of men were not well-intentioned and very appreciative of these women coming to spend a little bit of time with them, right? It's not to suggest that. Um, but the women in all of these wars, they often use this phrase, um, they say that they're living in a goldfish bowl, right? That they're not anonymous. They can't be anonymous in the war. Everywhere they go, they're very visible. And all of that attention on young women far from home is fun for many of them for about a week or two, right? It's nice that all of these guys think you are the coolest thing in the world and, you know, you're the prettiest thing they've ever seen, and, and that's nice for a while. And then it gets old, right? But your job is to make that man feel like he is also the center of the universe. And so you can't ever say, I'm tired, I want you to go away, I've seen way too many men this week, could I just have some time to myself? You can't do that, right? That's not your job. Um, several of the women actually swear that they are going to go join convents when they get home because they've had enough of men and they just can't stand to see another one. Um, and so part of what these women are doing is trying to figure out, again, how to balance that, right? What a lot of guys might have thought of as you know, harmless pranks, um, panty raids were apparently the, all of the rage in the 60s, and so that goes on in Vietnam, and the guys thought it was hilarious. But the women don't think it's quite that hilarious, right? And so anything from that to much, much worse that you might imagine, um, that gets old. And the women, what's really frustrating for them is that they don't feel they have much recourse. Um, in Cameron Air Base in Vietnam, the women... Uh, a woman in the USO put on a show, and some of the GIs in the crowd got very rowdy and started shouting obscenities and very violent threats at the women. And their commanders who were in the audience did absolutely nothing. And when the USO women complained, they were told that um, basically you should have seen it coming. Like, what else did you expect would happen? Um, and so that kind of, you know, dismissal, like boys will be boys, dismissal really rubbed them the wrong way. Um, and that didn't make them feel safe or protected, um, but they also had to manage that. Um, and so what can we learn kind of from all of this, right? Um, this is actually a picture of some of the women's billets in World War II, um, surrounded by barbed wire um, armed guards. But what can we learn from all of it? Um, I think these women show us a new um, way of thinking about wartime, Right? Many people, if they think about women in war, they think of nurses or they think of Rosie the Riveter. Um, they think of something more familiar. But these women, I think, have a very unique war experience. Um, and it's one we don't often think about, but perhaps we should. Um, they seek out a way to do their part for the war effort, right? and they seek out a way to be as involved and as close to the war as possible. Um, and so... I think that is interesting. I think they also tell us something about men in wartime as well, right? The women are there because of the men, and we learn something about what the military thinks men should be, right? In World War I, men are supposed to not go to Paris. By World War II, the military really didn't care if you went to Paris. Um, <laughs> again, the PG version. <laughs> um, but they're, you know, sort of evolving understandings of what men are supposed to do, how men are supposed to be in wartime, um, what they need to be reminded of, um, that kind of thing. I think it also opens a window into thinking about um, the relationship between the military and civilian society in wartime. Right? What did the American public think that it owed the military during these wars? How did that relationship change? Um, and as we think about how to apply the lessons of the 20th century to the 21st, our military today, as I said, is a much more diverse force, and it relies increasingly on women and on families, um, and we currently have military personnel deployed to conflicts around the world that have no end in sight. Um, they still go to war with the USO, as I mentioned, um, but they no longer go to war with women like the Donut Dollies or the Red Cross Clubmobile girls or the YMCA lassies from World War I. Um, those programs ended after the Vietnam War, and I don't think it's a bad thing that they did end. Um, in using women as symbols of the family for which men fought and to which they hope to return, the military and civilian organizations associate women with the home front even when they're in war, and sort of suggesting that women belong in the home even when they're not in the home. 
But programs employing women to serve hot chocolate and Kool-Aid to soldiers also, also positions them as men's supporters and not their equals. Organizations that held up women as symbols of both wholesome and sexualized ideals, sort of mom and sweetheart all at the same time, places women in untenable and often dangerous situations. And recreation and entertainment programs that offer women as antidotes to the military, sort of an escape from military life for a moment, suggests that women have no place in it. But Maybe these women also teach us something important about offering a warm smile and a sympathetic ear, about reminding those who serve on our behalf that they are remembered and appreciated. So I thank you for your attention, and I would welcome your questions. I guess I'll start. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm sure you've spoken to some of these women who are now, even say from the Vietnam era, who are now you know, still very much alive, uh, maybe in their 70s. Um, what, what, what's their recollection of these experiences in Da Nang or uh, Cameron or wherever they were you know, uh, 50 years ago? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the most fun parts of this project has been actually interviewing a lot of these women um, and so it's interesting to talk to them. You know, this for many of them was the time of their life. Um, you know, it was you know, one, one year of their life, right? Um, Red Cross women spent a year in Vietnam. And in many ways, it's such a short part of your life, but they think of it sort of as um, having a much more pronounced influence on their life than, than a year might suggest. Um, a lot of them really had a, a great time. Um, they enjoyed sort of... Um, the adrenaline of it, right, that you're constantly, you know, every day somewhere new, you're being choppered here and there, you're meeting new people from all over the United States, um, you know, and in the middle of what was the event of their generation, right, and so they really, for the most part, feel that they did their part for that war, um, and what's been interesting for me is that the women all have very different opinions on the war itself, um, but they universally believed that their job was to go and support those men. Whatever they thought of the politics of the war, their job was to be there. Um, what's also interesting to me is that if you ask them, you know, would you want, say, your daughter to go do this, the answer is often absolutely not. <laughs> so that kind of contrast has been really interesting, you know, that it was this great, kind of very exciting, um, stressful time, I wouldn't have changed it for the world, but I don't want my daughter to experience it as well. And I think that's also illuminating. Yeah. Um, I realize um, it, this, the way the women are recept, received and recepted over the years, and depending on the situation, the times that I'm sure things change. But um, was there any studies done with respect to, I know that you dealt with the US particularly, but. Um, how, particularly when we had coalition partners in um, countries in Afghanistan, Iraq, the, the Middle East, for instance, um, how women in other countries were received and also where, how were Americans were received uh, culturally when you went into these Middle Eastern countries with a very different way of yeah, no, looking at women. That's been really interesting. Um, in the sort of the post-Vietnam era with, when most of the United States' um, is, you know, involvement abroad is in the Middle East, um, in the first Gulf War, for example, there was a lot of kind of hand-wringing over what are we going to do, what are we going to do. Um, we can't send over the stereotypical USO show. Um, that was forbidden by the Saudis, for example. Um, they screened the mail of, G of GIs. They made sure that nothing sort of untoward was coming in. Um, even Bob Hope's wife couldn't get into the country for a while. Um, they wanted to send Brooke Shields, and the Saudis took her visa away. Like She was not getting in country. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. In earlier wars, the reception wasn't, you know, it didn't have that kind of cultural disconnect. Um, but at the same time, you've got women who are often being sent to be sort of the proper example of what women are supposed to be in contrast to local women. All right, so the Pacific Theater in World War II, anywhere um, non-Western 
these women, you know, the military says, it's absolutely urgent, we have to get American women there. Um, because they're supposed to be the idealized woman um, for the American soldiers, but it also suggests to local women that what they are doing is, is inappropriate or not, not mm -hmm. idealized. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting, you know, in different theaters and in different cultures how this plays out. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, th I think they want you to the mic, so. Okay. How many women were killed in this uh, one of the first A couple, I mean, not many. Um, there was a woman in World War I who um, got bronchitis on the boat going to France um, and was recovering, was actually on her way to recovering in a hospital, um, and the hospital was bombed. And the YMCA, she was with the YMCA, I think I might have said the Red Cross, sorry. She was with the YMCA, and the YMCA, praised her as a soldier, right? They termed her, they said her death was a soldier's death. And all of the articles about her um, as being the first woman in this line of work to be killed really praised her for her sacrifice and her, you know, her sort of dedication that she knew this kind of danger might come. Um, other women, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, there was a woman in Vietnam um, who was killed by an American GI who was mentally ill. Um, he, she was just the first person he, he saw um, basically, and she was murdered. Um, but it hasn't been that many. You know, often what what would happen would be something like you get sick, um, you get influenza at the end of World War One, um, that kind of thing. So a handful, but not not too many. So there's no real contact. No, not that kind of no, no. They do. Um, it's been interesting, um, so being from Texas, I'm sort of afraid that they're going to find me and take away my driver's license if I criticize the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders in any way. Um, but they do still make tours. Um, in the 80s, the, and there are lots of um, NFL cheerleader groups that do travel abroad. Um, in the 80s, they start to realize, especially with more women in uniform um, in the military, they start to realize that you know, cheerleaders on stage, scantily clad, that that's a little dicey. Um, and so what they started to do was organize like cheerleading camps for little kids. Like they made it more of a like sporting tour, um, but they still do the, the dance show. Um, they spend far more of their time signing autographs, just chit chatting with folks, you know, taking pictures, that kind of thing. But they still tour. Um, and when they dance, they do their, you know, the same thing you would see at halftime, I guess, at an NFL show, so. They're still there. Yeah. Thank you, and I appreciate the um, complexity you've brought to the issue in your comments. So I basically have two questions, and one of them is around the treatment of the women themselves. This is Me Too territory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Today, the idea of putting women in this kind of situation, I realize that this is supposed to be protective and that they're idealized instead of purely objectified. Mm -hmm. But I am curious if you would go into a little bit more about how were the women treated? Were there rapes? Were there assaults? Were there uh, what we would consider mm -hmm. inappropriate behavior? Was that part of the job? Or was in some way the, um, were there enough protections in place or were people on their good behavior? I'm very interested in that part of the experience. Would you haven't really touched on. Yeah. Um, and then the other is the, the, almost it seems as though going to Paris and the Asian women mm -hmm. as contracted, contrasted to these girls. If you wouldn't comment also on the perception or intent to separate American women and the appropriate treatment of American women to local women. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so it's complicated, right? <laughs> as you might, as you've just said, um, and trying to tease out those various threads has been um, really interesting, but also difficult. And in many ways, because the language we use, right, the words that that we say today to describe these things, assault, harassment, didn't exist for most of these women, right? Before the mid '70s, sexual harassment was not in our vocabulary, right? And so. Part of this process has been sort of looking backward in many, many earlier decades 
and trying to figure out how people talk about that, right? So officially, and, and there would never be any official in the military, in the Red Cross, the YMCA, the USO, anyone who would ever suggest or intend that anything untoward is happening here. Right? When they think of um, using women even as objects on stage, right, to be looked at or gawked at or whatever, um, it all kind of fits with the ways that women are used in wartime as motivation, as recruitment. I mean, you know, think of recruitment ads that have women, right, I want you for the U.S. Navy. Um, you're painting pinups on airplane noses, right? I mean, women's bodies get used as um, wartime imagery in lots of ways. Um, so they know, they absolutely know that this is introducing the possibility of danger, and they do, um, they do, I think, what they believe they can do to protect the women, right? So the guarded billets, not going around unescorted, not traveling alone, um, those kinds of things. But none of that protects everybody at all times, right? And what's most common are, you know, women who for 365 days are catcalled at and whistled at and leered at and guys following you around and asking you on dates over and over and over, um, you know, that kind of thing, escalating to men who genuinely believed in various wars that the women were there um, for the entertainment of officers um, and that that was unfair and they should also be available to enlisted men as well. You know, so assumptions that they are there um, as prostitutes basically. Um, some men genuinely believe that. Um, there were lots of rumors about how much it, they cost um, and very specific rumors about that. Um, you know, and so trying to figure that out um, you know, there are few women who have ever openly talked about harassment or rape. Um, we know that it has happened. Um, several, you know, a few women talked about it. Um, but trying to find that in records is difficult, right? Trying to find, um, I mean, even today, it's, it's the least report, or one of the least reported crimes in our society, right, for all sorts of reasons. And so, you know, women who feel that it's their job to be there to make the men feel welcomed and supported don't often feel that they can report things that they're uncomfortable with, right? And it puts them in a position where they feel that it's their job to just deal with it, right? Um, and they kind of, even in the ways they talk about it, um, I have a, a set of letters from a woman who was a Red Cross woman in World War II. I have her letters and I have her diary. And she describes in her letters home to her parents, um, she was at the Isle of Wight and they were on a boat and this port commander was, you know, took the women, on the, all the Red Cross women on the boat and they went out and they had, you know, sandwiches and tea and whatever. And she wrote, wrote in her letters home that, you know, this was a fine time and he was a nice guy and whatever. And in her diary she says very specifically, he was a little too handsy, right, he's putting his hands all over her, he's pressuring her, and that she's not telling her parents at home because she doesn't want them to worry. You know, and so you can, you kind of keep, take lessons from something like that and think, okay, well, in all of the newspaper articles or in things that they write for public consumption, you know, maybe they're shielding us from some of that. And so you're trying to read between the lines and, you know, find things that you actually don't want to find at all, um, but you know we're there. Um, and so I think that's the, the tension here is that you take women who really genuinely want to do something nice um, for people who are lonely. Um, and you're putting them in difficult situations where they have to figure that out on their own. Um, and it's, yeah. I'm, that doesn't actually give you a definite answer to your question. Um, actually, uh, and I don't know when you did the interviews, compared to when the Me Too movement started to open dialogue. Mm. Yeah. Did it come up in interviews? Not, the last interviews I did were really a little bit before that. Um, yeah. That would have been interesting how that clouded kind of the ways that people thought about it, though. Or yeah. Talk about it today. Yeah, and do you actually want to tell a total stranger that kind of thing? Um, you know, especially if you know that you know the interviews that I did um, end up digitized and on the internet, right? And is that something you want to talk about? 
if you know that the entire planet could see it in a few years? Maybe not. You know, yeah. It's a great question. Oh, yeah, in comparison to, to foreign women. Yeah, so um, it's, yeah, how we think of these women in relationship to foreign women um, and Asian women in particular, um, in Korea and in Vietnam, this becomes the, a big issue. You kind of see precursors of it in the Pacific in World War II. Um, there's this great moment where these uh, Red Cross women come to a... Um, come to the Pacific and the commander in the area puts them in the Jeep and he tells them to put their hair up in the helmets so that the men won't notice that they're women. And he says, I can't do any, if these guys, like hundreds of thousands of men in this region find out that women are here, I can't protect you. And I'm thinking, okay, well, you're the commander. <laughs> it's kind of your job. Um, but also he says that they haven't seen women in so many years. And you think, well, they've seen lots and lots of women. They just haven't seen American women. Um, and so there's a lot of concern when they talk about, um, especially non-Western and Asian theaters, that we need American women who are not in camp towns, right? We need to get, that these men can all go visit the camp towns and they can see all the Asian women they want, but we need to get them some model of wholesome sort of girl next door American womanhood. Um, and so it's, they're always, even when they're not, um, you know, World War I is sort of this moment when the military kind of becomes very moralistic about prostitution and says, no, we're, we're not doing that. They don't really care later. They care, they care later about illnesses, but not about prostitution itself, per se. Um, but even later, they're still using these women as counter images to prostitutes. Right, even if they don't really care, and even if the you know the medical staff are out screening prostitutes, so they're not getting people sick. Like they're managing it in lots of ways, but they still want these women, right? This kind of pigtailed girl from girl from home to symbolize what they want in womanhood. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. And so she asked if, um, if, on a more positive note, if some of these women did meet future husbands, and they did. Um, they did. There were um, women in World War II who married, and women in Korea and Vietnam. Um, in World War II, if you married, um, that was all fine and good, but then they wouldn't allow you to serve in the same theater as your spouse, which is an interesting thing. In that, if you were married, you were no longer everybody's sweetheart. Right? You were one person's sweetheart. <laughs> and so you couldn't serve in the same theater because they worried that your attentions wouldn't be focused on all of these men if your husband is around. Right? And probably vice versa, that he might not be so pleased <laughs> with seeing his wife go in the club and all of these guys wanting to dance with his wife. Um, by Vietnam, you had to be single to be in the program. Um, and so if you married, you went home. So another interesting way of kind of deflecting that. But, but yeah, lots of women, you know, and I don't have a number, but, you know, lots of women met, met husbands and got married, and it all worked out. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming. Thanks a lot. Folks, there will be a book signing one level up at the Archives Bookstore. The books are at the cash registers.